the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. Bob, you had us worried for a moment. We should have known that you're always dead on time. And we're grateful that we can all be here at Bob's invitation to celebrate the Requiem Mass for his beloved Helena. We particularly welcome Helena's family, siblings, Cecilia, Sylvia, Ivan, and Vincent, all of whom are here. And we remember in particular Martina in Kuala Lumpur, who cannot be with us. We're also united in prayer with Helena's wonderful nephews and nieces, Julian, Deborah, Juliana, who's come from Singapore, David, Oliver, Rex, Daniel, and David, all of whom are with us here this morning. And we remember those who are overseas, Geraldine, Cheryl, John, and Sean. And it's appropriate that we acknowledge the presence of the present Premier of New South Wales, the Honourable Chris Minns and Mrs Minns, the Deputy Premier, Prue Carr. How wonderful that we have ex-Prime Ministers from both sides of the aisle, Paul Keating, Paul Keating and Anita, so welcome, Malcolm Turnbull and Lucy. Helena, as you've heard, was always known as a wonderful peacemaker and she never pushed herself forward she must have had some way there at those interminable COAG meetings because we acknowledge the presence not only of Barry Unsworth, ex-Premier of New South Wales, but Jeff Gallup from Western Australia, Steve Brax from Victoria, Mike Rand from South Australia. We acknowledge also the presence of his great companion, Kim Beasley, and also present day ministers, including Jason Clare, who worked for Bob and will be making the tribute on behalf of the Prime Minister, and also ministers Matt Thistlewaite, Linda Burney, and Tanya Plibersek. We also welcome Senator Deb O'Neill. Here on the sanctuary with me are Monsignor Tony Doherty, Father Ed Campion, and Father James McCarthy, testament to what Bob calls the open spirit of Sydney Catholicism. So we gather and we come, as ever, asking the Lord's mercy. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. And from my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask the Blessed Virgin and all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting.
Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Please be seated for the tribute and the eulogy. I invite Jason Clare, who will deliver the tribute on behalf of the Prime Minister. It is an honour to stand here today representing the Prime Minister of Australia, Anthony Albanese. As I stand here, I can see the extraordinary life that Helena lived. I see her family and her many friends. I see a Premier, former Premiers, former Prime Ministers, and I see my former boss my dear and grieving friend. Together today, we wrap our arms around you, Bob, as we come together to celebrate the life of the woman you so beautifully described as the light of your life, the woman you affectionately call H. Helena was modest, funny, and whip smart. She was a brilliant businesswoman and she was the steel in Bob's back. A convent schoolgirl from Taiping who wrote letters to Australian schools and was accepted into Our Lady of Mercy College, Parramatta, who studied economics at Sydney University and who used those skills to build an extraordinary career. I was fortunate to spend just a little bit of time with Helena Carr, to know her kindness and her cheekiness, to know that irrepressible smile and her overflowing goodness and her sincerity. We are all fortunate that Helena chose Australia. Malaysia's loss was Australia's gain and by far Bob's greatest fortune. Helena and Bob were each other's world, each other's elixir for more than half a century. Perhaps it's fitting then that the last opera Helena saw on that last day in Vienna was Donizetti's The Elixir of Love, a story of love, real love, and the triumph of sincerity so perfectly Helena. May we all hold on to her glow, her light, and may she forever rest in peace. Thank you, Jason. I now invite Bob to deliver the eulogy. Why do you love me? She asked me in a playful, jesting mood. I said, it's easy, H. You've got a beautiful face, and you're always happy. Happiness is the theme of our celebration today. Happiness being her very essence. Happiness, if you like, her middle name. H, you've got the most infectious laugh. I remember Graham Richardson saying that when we were on a bus in 1982. I remember Paul Keating looking over his shoulder as we walked down George Street after a session of an ALP conference headed to the Costa Brava with its high cuisine. And he saw Anita only a month in the country striding along with Helena, and they were laughing their heads off. And Paul said, they just like a bit of fun. Helena 
It was nicknamed Smiley by one of the nuns at OLMC. She, she studded our days with joy, mischief, and wisdom. Helena taught me happiness. Some people ask me why I'm doing this today. Certainly the events of October 26 in Vienna are still raw, but in a city where I've raised my voice in so many causes over 50 years, I can't let this one pass. We can ask, where did the happiness come from? And here's my theory, and it'll bring a smile to our brothers and sisters. It came from that sleepy hollow you called your home. It came from Taiping, Malaysia, a city built on rubber plantations and tin mining, where a verdant hill rises above the town, very often mist, as much mist, her sister Sylvia says, at Brigadoon, and where the Sultan's Lodge is located on the tip of Maxwell Hills, but a beautiful lake garden in the town on the site of former tin mines. It was a town of terraces, terrace shops, Chinese and the Indian traders selling everything, jewelries, money lending. It was, it was a high culture, Chinese and Indian, but it was distinguished by a wonderful community of nuns, uh, Order of the Infant Jesus, a French order, but staffed with Irish nuns. I said to Helena once, these Irish nuns teaching you kids Irish jigs and songs, I said, you're Chinese and Indian. What was this about? She said, it was good. We loved it. It was a beautiful town, and the John family was respected. Her father, Lourdes John, a Jaffna Tamil, a Jaffna Tamil raised by De La Salle brothers, and her mother, a nurse and a midwife, the first, the first year to go through Malaysia's first boarding school, Malaya's first boarding school for girls. She taught health and hygiene to women in surrounding villages. Going to school at age five, Helena says she shrieked with fury when she saw her image in the mirror wearing a dress for the first time. She'd been raised with her brothers, Ivan and Vincent, and wore T-shirts and shorts. She took to school as no other youngster has. And when, when Mr. John took in a Chinese family who were refugees and installed them in the back of their home, Elena insisted, she was nine at the time, on taking the little girl to school to enroll her with the nuns. And a nun explained to her, you can't do this. You've got to bring a mother. We've got to see her birth certificate. And this passed into the mythology behind, between Helena and me. I'd often say to, I'd say to her occasionally, that's when she did something adventurous or a bit presumptuous. I'd say, that reminds me of you as a little girl taking Chung Mei to school for the first time and insisting on enrolling her. Helena's really special relationship was with her Chinese grandmother, who'd come out of the old world of China. She knew old pre-revolutionary, pre-1911 China. The China of courtyard houses and Buddhism and Confucianism. She had bound feet as a symbol of her roots in that time. And Helena always recalled the feel of her grandmother's hand on the palm, on, on, on her head, her grandmother's palm on her head, when as a four-year-old, Helena was surviving typhoid fever and her body was covered with wet banana leaves. Her relationship with her grandmother ran deep and when Helena spoke Hokkien, not Mandarin, but Hokkien, with a Putian accent, it was a tribute to the old lady. The photo 
we've got of Helena being seen off at Ipo Airport by gloomy brothers and sisters, her apprehensive mother and father coming to school all the way off in Sydney in 1965, doesn't show the old lady. The old lady was at home back in the bungalow, weeping her heart out at the loss of her little friend. And fearing she'd never see her again, and worse even than that, that Helena might marry someone who wasn't Chinese. Helena got a taxi from Sydney Airport to OLMC Parramatta. As the taxi pulled up, she said, no, this is not it. The taxi driver said, but you told me you've never been here before. And Helena imagined that any boarding school had to have a grassy lawn and a gravel drive. She was welcomed by the nuns after that misapprehension. And the nuns put her to bed, and when she woke up, recovering from the flight, she was surrounded by a big group of Australian girls there to welcome her. And she never lacked friends from that moment on, never. Every holiday was with a farm family in rural New South Wales. All of them delighted to have this spirited young Malaysian girl. I met her during a stopover in Tahiti, a swimming lapse in the pool, and he was this, he was this resolute non-swimmer, as it turned out, sitting on the edge, her feet dangling demurely into the water, reading a book, which gave me an opportunity to say, what are you reading? And it was, I remember the book, it was John Kenneth Galbraith's latest excursion called The New Industrial State. We discovered we had a common friend in Vicky Rubinson. The first time I took Helena out was to dinner at something called the Little Dutch Inn in King's Cross followed by a play, I think, Hamlet on Ice, starring Kate Fitzpatrick at the Nimrod Theatre in the stables. The second time was to a Labour Party fundraiser at Lane Cove. <laughs> and then I, I was shortly showing off by having her come to see me chair meetings of young Labour in Sydney Trades Hall. The point I'm making here she knew exactly what she was getting in for. And once she, once she confided shyly to me that with girls at Sancta Sophia College talking once about what husbands they might take, she speculated it would be kind of interesting to be married to a politician. We celebrated our wedding reception at Sancta Sophia College in February 1973. She recruited Father Ed Campion to perform the ceremony at the Swift's Darling Point, Ed, 1973 to 2023. Who would have thought this? She picked our first home, 46 French Street, Marubra, to $24,000. It didn't have many virtues except one. It was within the branch boundaries of the Marubra branch of the Labor Party which I was becoming secretary of. As you know from all this in our marriage, she was the CEO, the CFO, the chief strategist, and the financial planner, which left me to be the entertainment director down the corridor. But all I can say, H, is what entertainment? What entertainment? 40 years of it running strong. She loved the play, the humour, the personality of politics. As she got to know my colleagues in the right-wing machine, Paul Keating and Laurie Breard and Trish, the late John Ducker, Barry Unsworth and Pauline, Kerry Cybra, Graham Richardson, John McBean, Kath Anderson, the late John O. Johnson and Pauline. She got to know our contemporaries on the left, Rod Cavalier and Peter Crawford, who became signed up Helena fans 
from their first meeting. And of course, our precious friends, John and Christine McCarthy, who she knew from university. And even Malcolm Turnbull, who brought Lucy to our Maroubra home, 67 Cooper Street, for dinner on their first date. Elena watched as we manoeuvred a meeting between Malcolm and Paul Keating and saw them circle one another, curious. Malcolm later said to me, they said Lang was greater than Lennon. What will they say about your mate Paul? Keating is greater than Kerensky? To which I can say today, well, yes, he was greater than Kerensky, the, 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 the Prime Minister of Russia after the February Revolution. Paul greater than Kerensky by a great margin. All this was part of the human comedy that fed Helena's smiles. And she mixed, she mixed with friends in the Labour Party in those years as breezily, decades later, she was to mix with the ASEAN foreign ministers and their wives, with whom she went on to maintain friendships over the last 10 years. The Shanmugans from Singapore, the Natalagawas from Indonesia, and Anifa and his wife Rubia from Malaysia. She warmed a Prime Minister letter from Italy and his wife Gianna and made them friends. In our early years, I remember a disagreement, young people learning to live with one another. I totally forget what it was about and we both wanted a way out. I got up and put on a 45 of the McCartney Lennon song, We Can Work It Out. Try to see things my way. Do I need to keep on talking till I can't go on? While you see it your way, run the risk of knowing that our love may soon be gone. She said how much she liked the gesture. If you think about it, the words were written to illustrate her spirit. The McCartney Lennon lyrics said it all for Helena. Life is very short and there's no time for fussing and fighting, my friend. We can work it out. We can work it out. We can work it out. She suspected that her mother had a secret desire that her daughters would become tough professionals. And she felt a mother's guiding hand as Helena made her own business career. You won't be able to wear slacks, they said when she applied for a first job at Lee Martin. She said she wouldn't be wearing a skirt. With the benefits of her economic studies fueled by the brilliant sister Germaine at OLMC, she was all equipped to criticize Lee Martin's publishing business, running at a loss, and to take up the job of fixing it, which in six months she did. She won a contract from Telstra to produce the electronic yellow pages. She arranged Newsweek simultaneous publishing by satellite. In 1984, she took over security printing division, producing postage stamps for Australia Post, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Malaysia, even Uganda. They planned an Idi Amin toilet in their factory, expecting a visit, a promised visit from the Ugandan leader. She also ran a business with checkbooks, making checkbooks and traveler's checks, bonds, passports and airline tickets. Security printing, it was tough. It was specialized. She was running operations, employing more than 1,100 people. With a turnover in 1990 of 160 million, she was appointed to the board of the company in 1984. So here she is, young, Malaysian, Chinese Indian, getting appointed to the board of an Australian company running a tough competitive business. Here's, thing I, here's something I find touching to this day. At around the same time, I was running to get elected to the ministry of the Rand government and become Neville Rand's Minister for Planning and Environment. She didn't want to take the gloss off my triumph. She waited to tell me she'd been appointed to the board 
after I had been signed in by the Governor as Minister, as a member of the Executive Council. She didn't want to take the gloss of, of my greasy poll success. She kept the story about her board, board appointment to herself until that was over the, out of the way. I remember in 1990 waking up and thinking I must have left the radio on downstairs. I'd just become leader of the opposition. And I tiptoed to the top of the steps and I heard this tentative voice say, ladies and gentlemen, it's with great pleasure that I accept your invitation. My staff had asked her to give a speech to a women's group in the eastern suburbs. Nothing was more alien to Helena than giving a public performance. She'd worried about it all night. She'd got up before daylight and gone down to practice it. She was so keen to make a contribution, even in an area that was against all her instincts. And then we come to 2003, Eric Rusendahl, the party secretary, says to me, going for a, a third, fourth year term, we need to find ways of freshening up the image. Helena is liked. We'll get her to tell the story. I said, Eric, she does not like public speaking. You'll not persuade Helena to cut TV and radio ads. He arranged to meet her. From my office, I could see through a glass petition the conversation between party secretary and campaign director and Helena. I'll never forget, I, I saw her in profile, that lovely nose which started out as a bold Indian Aryan nose and then was captured by the Chinese genes which flattened it. I saw her in profile, the nose and the, the intent eyes, and she was nodding as Eric explained what he wanted from her. She went on to bravely do it, to cut those ads. They raided their socks off. They helped us hold frontline seats and get that challenging third four-year term. It was another celebratory election night for us, a total of four. And I meant what I said when I paid tribute from Vienna. It's inconceivable I could have done this for the party without Helena by my side. She loved the entertainment of the Maroubra Labour Party branch. She loved our neighbours in French Street, Maroubra. At Maroubra Junction, she bargained with the Ukrainian delicatessen, enchanted the staff at the fish markets, pursued the best cuts at Peter's Meats. It seemed she could command a network of tradesmen, gardeners, builders, who all called her Helena. I said, I said, H, you build up this Helena club. It's a fan club. And I said, it must owe a lot to all that trading in old Taiping, going to the markets with your mother, picking the best chickens to be slaughtered and cooked for dinner and all the rest. But I was intrigued too by the rapport she had with older ladies, that, that special friendship she had with Anita Keating's mother. They couldn't have been closer. And I said once, when we're on the campaign trail, the old Greek ladies, H, all seem to love you. I said, it's a conspiracy of the dark-eyed. But she said it was the message of her deep, loving relationship with the old woman in Taiping, who lived to be over 100, with her grandmother. It was the serenity and the spiritual force of that special relationship. Anyway, as a writer said, people who make us happy are the charming gardeners who make our souls blossom. In 1971, we saw a film directed by Ken Russell. It was called The Boyfriend, and it included the song, You Are My Lucky Star. I saw you from afar, two lovely eyes at me, gleaming, beaming, I was starstruck. As we walked across Railway Square, Helena looked up and said, you are my lucky star. To this day, it's the most beautiful compliment I've ever received. 
that she, this angel, would take a bet on me, the gawky kid from Matraville with preposterous ambitions. But you're a very astute mob, our friends here in this cathedral today. You know she got it the wrong way around. You know that Helena was Bob's lucky star. And meeting her was a stellar explosion of good fortune in his life. As the song said, you've opened heaven's portal here on earth for this poor mortal. You are my lucky star. Shakespeare gave Juliet and Romeo and Juliet these words about the death of Romeo. <clears throat> and I tweak them so the gender, I tweak the gender so that they can apply to Helena. If she should die, take her and cut her out in little stars, and she shall make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. Cut her out in little stars. If tonight NASA telescopes identify a constellation on the far rim of the Milky Way, they'll note that each of these new stars sparkles with the most concentrated, lively, spirited gleam. And they'll even note a suggestion of mischief in the way they gleam. And if one of those astronomers cracks the code, they might find a message that says, hey, life is very short. There is no time for fussing and find, fighting. Smiling goes a long way. We farewell a Chinese Indian girl from this idyllic tropical town, educated by wonderful Irish nuns, drawn to Australia in a convent school, recruited so improbably to Australian public life, all while she ran a business, tough competitive business in Australian manufacturing. And the spirit is here today, urging us to be joyful in a happy cosmos. About that lovely last day in Vienna on October 26, I reflect, H, that we seem to be at peace in our 50-year partnership. We accepted, without admitting it, that time would not be ours forever. And we're just in a resting place that meant we were happy to see the other one happy. No partner could have smiled more than she did as we walked across Vienna having fun on that last day. That was where our journey our 50-year journey had taken us to a kind of calmness and wisdom. And where it ended so suddenly, so cruelly cut off. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Leaving me to say, my friend, as your co-conspirator in this half-century collaboration, Thank you, my lucky star. Farewell, my little friend, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Thank you, Bob. Let's spend a moment in silence, in thanks for the wonderful life of Helena and the happy marriage of Bob and Helena. Please stand. Let us pray. To you, O Lord, we humbly entrust Helena, so precious in your sight. Take Helena into your loving arms, where there is no sorrow, no weeping nor pain, but the fullness of peace and joy, 
with your Son and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Please be seated for the readings. And we invite Elena's sister Sylvia for the first reading. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord.
now invite Alina's niece, Deborah, for the second reading. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. The life and death of each of us has its influence on others. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So that, alive or dead, we belong to the Lord. This explains why Christ both died and came to life. It was so that he might be Lord of both the dead and of the living. We shall all have to stand before the judgment seat of God. As the scripture says, by my life, it is the Lord who speaks. Every knee shall bend before me, and every tongue shall praise God. It is to God, therefore, that each of us must give an account of oneself. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Deborah and Sylvia. Let's now stand and greet the gospel. according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revive you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord.
prophet Isaiah says, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will prepare for all peoples a banquet of rich food. Bob told me that in preparation for the wedding at Swift's and at Sancta Sophia, he had to tell his train driver father there'd be no beer, but only fine wine, as Helena had prescribed. That there began a beautiful new journey for Bob and Helena, a banquet of rich food. We Christians are foolish and wise enough, we hope, but definitely bold enough, to proclaim that there will be a heavenly banquet of rich food, and that Helena is now called to that, and for that we pray. As we reflect on the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Fresh and green are the pastures where he gives me repose. That young girl who came unaccompanied from Malaysia and found a home, found fresh pastures, particularly there at OM OMC, at Parramatta, and then at Sancta Sophia. You have prepared a banquet for me in the sight of my foes. My head you have anointed with oil, my cup is overflowing. And we've heard about the wonderful life that Bob and Helena have shared, and that she was able to run successful businesses, and that life was good to her. Surely goodness and kindness shall follow me all the days of my life. In the Lord's own house shall I dwell forever and ever. And to think just of those last wonderful days, enjoying the opera in London and on to Vienna. And in those recent months, as her friends have said, that there seemed to be a renewed peace and a new sense of perspective about the fullness of life. And so we contemplate those Beatitudes from Matthew. Blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. If ever there was an unwilling First Lady, but one who was always a gentle presence. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. One who was so self-contained and independent. She knew what she was about. She knew that she was loved. She knew the ultimate meaning of her life. And blessed are the peacemakers. As her family attest, she was, yes, the slightly spoilt, youngest, sixth child, but she was always the one to make peace. She was always the one to maintain the family contacts despite the tyranny of distance. And the presence today of politicians from every state in the Federation, the presence of ex-Prime Ministers from both sides of the aisle, attest that here was one in her own gentle way was a peacemaker, and for that we give thanks. Here in this cathedral today, Helena's life has come together completely. The institutions which helped shape her, primarily her family, her marriage with Bob, the Labour Party, and the church, particularly its educational institutions. And we give thanks for all of those blessings. But we pray not only for her, but also for those of us who mourn, particularly family and particularly Bob. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. We pray that her smile might help you endure the difficult times ahead, and that what she asked of you, you may always complete.
that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the glory of his holy church. As we humbly present to you these sacrificial offerings, O Lord, for the salvation of your servant Helena, we beseech your mercy that she, who did not doubt your son to be a loving saviour, may find in him a merciful judge who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It's truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For through his paschal mystery, he accomplished the marvelous deed by which he has freed us from the yoke of sin and death, summoning us to the glory of now being called a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for your own possession, to proclaim everywhere your mighty works, for you have called us out of darkness into your own wonderful light. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you die. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world, and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis our Pope, and Anthony our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember your servant, dear Helena, our sister and our faithful daughter of the Lord. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of a resurrection and all who have died in your mercy 
Welcome them into the light of your faith. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and, and Blessed Joseph, her sponsor, with the Blessed Apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. Here on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, we pray in confidence as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from all evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin, and protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. We pray for peace in our so troubled world, peace in our families, peace in our relationships, peace in our hearts. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom where you live forever and ever. Amen. The Lord's peace be with you always. And with and your spirit. spirit. We share that peace together. Who's doing it? Let's please share. Yes, Mark. Please pray. Good to have you. This is Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away our sin. We are happy called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Communion will be available here at the front of the cathedral and halfway down the nave.
On your behalf, I thank the choir of St. Mary's Cathedral, particularly the music director, Daniel Justin, who has just arrived here in Sydney from Norwich. So we hope it'll be a very blessed time for him here in Australia. Let's stand for the final prayer. Grant, we pray, O Lord, that your servant Helena, for whom we have celebrated this Paschal Sacrament, may pass over to a dwelling place of light and peace through Christ our Lord. Amen. I now invite Father Tony Doherty to come forward for the final commendation and farewell. This uh, simple rite is a farewell to this remarkable woman from the church here in Sydney, from her parish of Maroubra, and for all of those people who love her. It's a prayer of trust. Trusting in God, we have prayed here for Helena, and now we come to the last farewell. There is sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we shall see her again in some incredible way and enjoy her friendship. Although we will disperse in sorrow, the mercy of God will gather us together again in the joy of her kingdom. Therefore, let us console one another in the faith of Jesus Christ. We now have two simple rituals, really. We bless this presence of uh, Helena with water. It's a sign of life, of vitality, of the energy of this woman. And then we incense her presence in great respect for the friendship and the connections and the people she brought together in love.
Let us pray. Gracious and gentle God, Lord of all creation, you desire that nothing redeemed by your Son will ever be lost, and that the just will be raised up on the last day. Comfort us today with the word of your promise as we lay our sister to rest. Grant Helena a place of rest and peace where the world of dust and ashes has no dominion. Confirm us in our hope that she will be created anew on the day when you will raise her up in glory to live with you and all the saints forever and ever. There's a final uh, blessing, actually, that Helena knew from a, uh, from a contemporary Irish poet by the name of John O'Donoghue. Uh, an Irish blessing, Bob, we, we offer to you this remarkable woman. Helena, may there come across the waters a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And may a gentle wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. Amen. Eternal rest grant to this blithe spirit, our Lord, and may perpetual light shine upon her. May her soul and the souls of the faith that departed, with the mercy of God, rest in peace. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How wonderful to have Tony and Ed with us today. The Lord be with you. May the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And may Almighty God bless all of us who are gathered here, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord. <laughs>